coming up. Behind closed doors, I was really killing myself. A fatal disorder that's killing our youth. It is all you can think of. Find out what they're trying to hide from you. And then... I will get up, and I will get up, and I will get up. Watch what happens when this spider almost got knocked out. I've lost everything. I'm done. Just go grab a gun. Plus, get ready to fire up the grill on today's 700 Club. It's prime time, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 700 Club. Is our president in touch with reality? Is Ben Rhodes, his advisor, in touch with reality? They have said that their uh, work in relation to ISIS is uh, effective. They said ISIS was the JV team, and uh, they've beaten ISIS. But somehow ISIS didn't get the memo, and uh, they're winning all the time. And they just took a key city uh, in Anbar province, Ramadi, and uh, they're on the way to Baghdad. It's just a question of how soon they will take over that nation. So people are saying, what gives with the president? Well, Iraq has also become a major issue for Republican presidential candidates, with many being asked, did President Bush do the right thing when he invaded Iraq? Gary Lane has the story. The taking of Ramadi was the biggest gain for ISIS this year. They've sent in huge numbers of uh, vehicle-borne IEDs, big trucks, massive amounts of explosion and they've destroyed the place. It seemed that ISIS was on the run after the Iraqi government retook the city of Tikrit last March. But as they did in Mosul last June, Iraqi soldiers fled from the advance of ISIS in Ramadi. The Islamic State's control over the capital city of Anbar province is now calling into question the Iraqi government's ability to stop ISIS and the Obama administration's strategy of airstrikes only. Senator John McCain says the United States needs more boots on the ground in Iraq to stop ISIS. A recent CNN poll showed only about half of Americans believe current U.S. policy will lead to the defeat of ISIS. And 80 percent say ISIS poses a serious threat to the United States. The ISIS victory comes as some members of the U.S. media are calling into question President Bush's decision to go to war in Iraq. They're asking declared and potential Republican presidential candidates if knowing what Americans know now, did Bush make the right decision? Based on what we know now, I think everyone agrees. Was it a mistake? Still, was it a mistake to go to war with Iraq? Uh, it's too, it was, I'm, I'm asking you just... Yeah, I understand, but that's not the same question. But, I'm ask, but that's the question I'm asking you. Was it a mistake to it go It was to, not a mistake for the president to decide to go into Iraq because at the time he was I, told... I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you... In hindsight. To, yes. Well, the world is a better place because Saddam Hussein is not there. So, so was I it a wouldn't mistake characterize or not? It, But I don't understand the question you're asking. I'm asking you, knowing everything, as we no, sit here in 20. But that's 15, not the way presidents don't... A president cannot make a decision. I, on what understand. someone might know in the future. But that's what I'm asking you. Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal is considering a run, but is yet to declare his presidential candidacy. He says a hypothetical question about the past is not the right question to ask at this moment in time. The reason we have problems with Iraq today is not George W. Bush's strength, it is because of President Obama's weaknesses. The reason we have instability today is that this president, President Obama, created a void there. Absent from the hard hypothetical questions about Iraq, Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. She's answered less than a dozen media questions since launching her campaign last month and hasn't answered a reporter's question in weeks on any subject. And many analysts still say President Obama made a mistake by cutting back on American troops in Iraq. So what America did in Iraq and mistakes by both the Bush and Obama administrations are likely to get more media attention and scrutiny as the 2016 presidential campaign heats up as will the question of what needs to be done to defeat ISIS. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. We don't really gain anything by looking back and having recrimination about what would you have done or couldn't have done and so forth. The thing is, what are you going to do now? You've got an immediate threat and we've got to deal with it. But the truth is, going into Iraq in that war was a big mistake. We interviewed on this program, I interviewed, Saddam's bomb maker. He was the man who was supposedly in charge of thermonuclear weapons for Iraq and Saddam Hussein. And he basically said they do not have the technology and the ability to bring out a nuclear bomb. And I knew it. 
I hope the CIA knew it. I hope the president knew, knew it. But he was being fed a, a tissue of lies, and you're hearing all these reports about yellow cake and all that nonsense. And it was a snow job to try to sell that war. And uh, we shouldn't have gone into it. It's cost a trillion or more dollars. It was a big mistake. And going in then, we shouldn't have. And looking at it in hindsight, you shouldn't have. It was a bad mistake. But what was done later by Obama has been a worse mistake, because having gotten us in there, then he allows these uh, radicals to take over the country. And all the gain and all the treasure and all the sacrifice of men and women's lives uh, has been wasted. And that, to me, is a great tragedy as well. So what would you do now? What's got to be done now is we have to have a massive effort to destroy ISIS. It cannot be allowed to take over Iraq. It cannot be allowed to take over Syria. It cannot be allowed to take over the Levant, which is what they want. They want the whole Middle East. We can't let them do it. It'll, it'll be a clear threat to the United States of America, and we can't let them do it. Well, in other news, a leading political analyst is calling out her fellow liberals. Guess that. She says they're intolerant. <laughs> oh, what a surprise when it comes to conservative viewpoints. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Pat Kirsten Powers warns some on the left are trying to suffocate free speech, and she says the country is moving in an authoritarian direction. Heather Sell spoke with her about the trend, which she explains in her new book. The United States may have strong protections for free speech in the First Amendment to the Constitution, but USA Today columnist and Fox News commentator Kirsten Powers says in reality that freedom is facing a serious threat. In her book, Powers, a lifelong liberal, says her fellow liberals are behind today's attacks on free speech. She calls it a systematic silencing. They call themselves liberals, but they're completely illiberal. So they are people who, who just really believe that th their ideology and their partisan viewpoints are the right way and that anything that deviates from that needs to be silenced. And, and they don't want to debate it. They don't want to have a conversation about it. They want you to shut up. That shutting down of ideas, says Powers, is everywhere. It is accomplished by delegitimizing and demonizing those with unpopular views or just opinions that liberals don't like. In her book, Powers cites what she calls a vicious smear campaign against Chick-fil-A president Dan Cathy for saying he supported traditional marriage. She warns of college campuses that have booted Christian clubs for supposed discrimination when all they did was hold fast to biblical beliefs. And she says everyone should be concerned about the firing of Brendan Eich, the head of the internet company Mozilla, for his donation to a California measure supporting traditional marriage. That was in 2008, and it's what Barack Obama thought. And Barack Obama was at Rick Warren's church saying that he opposed same-sex marriage for religious reasons. So what's the thing today that in five years is going to get you fired? Powers, who found Christ nine years ago, says friendships with fellow believers have opened her eyes to attacks on conservative and Christian viewpoints. Perhaps her biggest concern, a left-wing culture at universities that squashes open and honest civil debate. Power cites the feminist professor in California who called pro-life demonstrators terrorists and stole their sign. What's happening is extremely authoritarian, even though it's not the government. Um, it's just, it's an attitude that like, we know best, and we're going to tell you what you're allowed to think or say. And if you don't do what we think or say, then we're going to destroy your reputation and maybe get you fired and maybe make it so you can never work again. Power says the stakes are huge. If attacks on free speech go unchecked, she worries that society could shift to groupthink and reject any dissent. I just don't think that the, probably most young people have any idea what that does to a society, that you cannot have freedom without being able to disagree. Heather Sells, CBN News. 
Ann Power says she wouldn't be surprised if the people she calls illiberals try to silence her book by working to destroy her credibility. She says such a move would make her point about how some on the left are trying to shut down dissent. Well, it turns out an argument over a parking spot may have started that deadly shootout between Texas motorcycle gangs, according to the Dallas Morning News. Authorities say they sent warnings earlier this month. Tensions were growing between two of the gangs that were involved in the gunfight. Nine people died, 18 were injured, and nearly 200 suspected motorcycle gang members were arrested. Nine, uh, the police say the rival gangs were meeting Sunday at a restaurant so members could settle some differences that they had. About an hour later in the restroom, the fighting began. In my nearly 35 years of law enforcement experience, this is the most violent and most gruesome scene that I have dealt with. It was really, really scary. They said people outside the doors had guns. <laughs> The FBI is calling outlaw biker groups a serious national domestic threat. While the bull market is still hitting records on Wall Street, with the Dow Jones Industrial and the Standard & Poor's 500 closing at record highs Monday, the Nasdaq has already gone above the record it set back at the end of the tech bubble in 2000. So that puts all the major indices in record territory, with the Dow solidly above its old high, even adjusted for inflation. Some analysts still warn of the possibility of a pullback in the months ahead, but others say the market is likely to keep moving higher over time, even if it does suffer some corrections. Get ready for hotter than normal summer across much of the country. The Farmer's Almanac, set, Almanac says warm weather will slowly arrive, but by July, the summer weather will really heat up, with much of the country sweltering in temperatures ranging from higher than normal to much higher than normal. Editor Peter Geiger says, Summer 2015 will see lots of sizzling and muggy conditions, so get those air conditioning units tuned up. You're going to need them. Pat, sounds like a lot of us will be spending more time indoors. Well, I'd head for the mountains. I tell you, down here in Tidewater, it's already very muggy today. It's just horrible yes. muggy. It's warming up. Well, we had yeah. kind of a cold winter, so. Well, you know, the, the, the farmers are right on uh, really for, for last winter. I mean, they talked about how cold it was going to be, and they were absolutely right. Well, uh, they're talking about a hot summer, and I, um, horribly to think of it, it's going to be right, too, and how you get away from it, it's just, oh, man. Get your air conditioning fixed now. Believe them. These guys are good. Terry. Well, many teenage girls are carrying a secret, one that could kill them. So many people are going undiagnosed and untreated, and no one deserves to live a life like that. Learn how to recognize the warning signs of this disorder when we come back. Bulimia, anorexia, there's so many different names to it, but millions of Americans live with and hide eating disorders. Even though they can, these disorders can threaten their physical and mental health, health reporter Laurie Johnson joins us now to tell us what, uh, uh, she, uh, what's at stake and how some people are breaking free. Here's Laurie. Pat, doctors estimate almost 5% of teenage girls suffer from this problem. That's a lot. And the worst part is their families often have no idea. The longer a person has an eating disorder, the harder it is to stop. So for some people, their doctor can refer them to an eating disorder specialist in their hometown, and regular appointments with that person there in, in their hometown can do the job. But there are other people who are in so deep, they really need to go to a treatment facility and stay there for a while, sort of like rehab. For 15 years, McCall Dempsey appeared to be the picture of success but she was hiding a dangerous eating disorder. All the while, nobody knew that behind closed doors, I was really killing myself to try to find some comfort in finding perfection and shrinking my body into trying to be this perfect size. Eating disorders are things like starving yourself, making yourself vomit after eating, abusing laxatives, and over-exercising. Dempsey did all of that and became addicted to diet pills. I'll never forget the nights where I would lay on the floor just in cold sweats, and I remember looking in the mirror and I was just gray. She finally decided she needed help and checked into Carolina House, a center for treating her illness. Executive Director Tammy Holcomb says among psychiatric illnesses, eating disorders are the most fatal. 
we see a lot of young people, even as young as 14 or 16, who have heart attacks and, and serious heart problems where they have to have pacemakers put in. These disorders can also lead to kidney and liver problems, hair loss, insomnia, and much more. We're going to see a lot of problems with throat and um, with esophagus and with teeth. Um, and that's because they bring the acid back up into their mouth that causes damage to the teeth. Matter of fact, one of the first people to recognize bulimia is a dentist. In addition to tooth damage, there are other warning signs, such as a preoccupation with weight. Your whole world is consumed by food and body. It is all you can think of, and that's not living. Other signals to watch for? Going to the bathroom immediately after eating large amounts of food missing, and excuses not to eat. I would always go to dinner with my friends, but I would always tell my friends that I already ate, and I would tell my family that I ate with my friends. Even though patients attempt to hide the problem, it's often family and friends who first recognize and recommend the need for treatment. Most people stay here about a month and a half. Residents are closely monitored to make sure they eat enough and help them keep it down. When someone has been um, purging and vomiting up their food for a period of time, it's very hard to sit with food in their stomach. It's actually painful. After the body heals, patients must recognize the root cause of their problem. What the eating disorder often is for a lot of people is a way to have some control in their life because of other situations, be it um, life changes, family events, things like that, they feel like they lose control. So this feels like they can gain some sense of control by controlling what they eat, controlling what they don't eat. Mental health professionals stay available around the clock to help patients learn appropriate ways to cope with life. I don't have to be perfect anymore. So many people are going undiagnosed and untreated, and no one deserves to live a life like that. Residents need to master new skills before they're ready to leave. To them, it feels like I'm taking control away from them because I'm going to tell them, okay, this is what you need to eat. These are the portions you need to be eating. And they feel like, oh my gosh, you're taking my control. It's the only thing I have. So we're empowering them. I like to think of it like empowering them to learn what their body needs, learn the choices that they need to be making, um, and learning to really just take that back for themselves. Most of all, they learn how to stop obsessing about food. It was like I found a whole new me, and now I live every day in that awesome place. Like many other mental conditions, people with eating disorders face the risk of relapse. The key here is learning to recognize those dangerous behaviors and hopefully correct them before losing control. Lori Johnson, CBN News. I've uh, been involved. Uh, one young man I remember, uh, he had... Um, uh, this uh, disorder, and he just wouldn't eat, and he just got wasted and thinner and thinner and thinner, and it was just a tragedy. You did everything you could to help him. I did everything I could to encourage him to help him and everything, but it was too late in his case when, by the time I got there. And you remember the singing group, the Carpenters? I thought they had yeah. a marvelous sound, but the girl, you know. Karen Carpenter, Karen yeah. She Car had, a, to, today, when you hear her music, you recognize her voice. It was very distinctive. It's an incredible voice, but I mean, she, she starved herself to death. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when you don't get help soon enough, yeah. serious help, this, you know, it's hard to This can be treated uh, as a demonic possession thing. It is, it is like a demon, and it needs to be rebuked and, and cast out. But these people need all kinds of attention. They need care. They need uh, self-image. They need, uh, I mean, our whole rehab program, and it's not something you can just pat them on the back and say, well, hey, hey, uh, why don't you eat it? I've got you a nice steak. Uh, no way. Mm -hmm. that, that it doesn't, doesn't work. work that way. No. I, I think getting in touch with that control issue is a big, yeah. big thing. But, it, you know, but young girls particularly at that Mm -hmm. incredible age, don't have a self-image, they don't quite know what to do, and they look at a mirror and they see themselves as enormous. I mean, you look at them and they say, well, what an attractive young lady. They look at themselves and they see this fat thing and they just fight. I mean, it's just incredible, but it is demonic. It is, it is an awful thing. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't dismiss it because there are just too many dead teenagers and, and young ladies mm -hmm. uh, who kill themselves with this. And it's not just uh, girls, it's boys as well. But it's a horrible concept. And Laurie, I appreciate uh, uh, your, your story on that.
And folks, if you have questions about eating disorders or other medical stories, you can talk to Laurie by using hashtag, quote, Ask Laurie on Twitter. Okay. Well, up next, one fighter takes on the world. People did to me whatever they wanted to do to me, and I had no power to change it. It was me against everyone else. Hear how he finally won the battle. That's next. Welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club. We're so glad you're with us wherever you happen to be watching, uh, whether it's on the Internet or on TV or whatever. We're delighted to have you with us. I want to tell you about Tom Mann. Tom got beat up by life. His mom was sick. His dad was a crook. And Tom spent his years being abused and knocked down. So one day he figured if he couldn't win at life, he might as well end his own life. You knock me down as many times as you want, and I will get up, and I will get up, and I will get up, and I will get up. Tom Mann's fighter mentality didn't develop overnight. A black belt in karate, Tom had to train for years in a number of mental and physical disciplines. But he always had a natural drive to protect himself and control others. I believed that you could do it on your own. You didn't need other people. It was me against everyone else. And if, if I was going to win, it was all on me. Tom learned early on that he could only depend on himself. His mother had MS and was in a nursing home most of his life. His father was an alcoholic and con artist, in and out of jail from the time Tom was four. I never knew from day to day when I was living with my dad, do I have a place to live? Do I have something to eat? Do I still have my possessions? Or did I lose them all again? When his dad was behind bars, Tom lived in foster homes and was physically abused at some. I was a piece of property, and the state moved me wherever they wanted to move me. People did to me whatever they wanted to do to me, and I had no power to change it. The only thing that kept Tom going was love for his mother. She was, she was my strength through the whole thing. And what I went through was nothing. Just nothing compared to what she went through. You know, I, I, I always thought, if she can do that and rot right away in a nursing home bed, I can, I can suck it up. I can go through homelessness and no food and getting beaten and all that stuff because there's nothing compared to what she's going through. So he fought his way through the tough times and even excelled in high school. The success numbed his pain until he got out of the foster care system. Something snapped in my head where I went, I'm free of all that, and I made it. This anger came out of nowhere. I didn't, I'd never been an angry guy before, but I was really angry, I mean, raging angry. In college, Tom used his anger to control situations and protect himself. I was still going to succeed no matter what the barriers were. I just felt like I was the king of the world, that no one could beat me, and, and I was smarter, faster than everyone else. He pushed everyone but his mother away, and soon started to struggle with the man he'd become. I'd look myself in the mirror and just go, <sighs> don't like that guy, just don't like him. I don't like what he stands for, I don't like what he's doing, I know it's wrong. Then, his mother died. At that point, I just kind of stopped and didn't care. I didn't care about success anymore. I, mom was the meaning of my life. No more mom, no more meaning. Tom dropped out of school and tried to make sense of his life of hardship. He had a theory about God's role in it. And I'm like, okay, God, if that's what we're going to do, if you're going to make me bear my cross to prove my worthiness to you, you won't beat me either because I am worthy and I will prove it to you. Tom joined the army where he worked hard and quickly climbed to the top 1% in his class. Then just when he thought he'd proven himself again, he blew out both knees playing basketball. I went from being the top guy to being defective in a day. I was at the end of my rope when I joined the Army, and now the Army's kicking me out. I've lost everything. I'm done. Just go grab a gun and kill yourself. There's no purpose. And that's when uh, Jesus revealed himself and said, all I ever wanted to do was carry you. And I think back and say, what an idiot. <laughs> 
I was. Um, imagine how much pain I could have saved myself had I known that Jesus. And uh, I, I submitted myself right there and then in the barracks. I said, great, carry me. I saw it all so clearly. I had kept him out of my life just like I kept everyone else out of my life. And so he was the first one I let in, truly let in. Tom was medically discharged from the Army, but found new purpose and healing through his relationship with Jesus Christ. I finally understood who he was, a God who loved me, who cared for me, who wanted to help me and provide for me and protect me. Slowly we worked through this, my life of these people and episodes and forgiveness for myself and all these different things, my failures. Don't, don't worry about that, Jesus says. You know, go forward, don't look back. Don't live in the past. Today, Tom works in full-time ministry. He's married to a woman who loves martial arts as much as he does, but now he just practices for fun. I'm a changed man. I don't have to be angry. I don't have to fight anybody. Uh, I have nothing to fear. It's a great thing to know a God who uh, loves you so much where he says, my grace is sufficient, relax. Just take it easy and I'll carry you along. And just, just do what I want you to do. Just do what I tell you to do. And you're gonna be amazed at what I'm gonna do for you. You know something? You and I are weak. We really are. Human beings, all of us, the strongest of us are weak to God. You see, he caused all the planets to come into being, all the galaxies to come into being, all the, the gigantic star clusters, the massive space that we live in, this earth we're on. He brought it all into being by his hand. That's how strong he is. And so when Jesus comes into your life, there's strength you can't believe. And he says, you look at a mountain and you say, be removed and cast into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart, and it'll obey you, because that's the kind of power that we have. And Tom Mann finally found it. He didn't have to prove anything. He didn't have to fight his way up. He just let Jesus do it. And Jesus wanted to carry him. And Jesus wants to carry you. And he can take you to heights you never dreamed possible and to successes you never dreamed possible and to blessing you never dreamed possible. And all he says to you is, will you turn your life over to me and let me take it? And if you will, watch what happens. And so right now, I'll ask you if you would just surrender to him, just trust him, and allow the power of Jesus Christ to work in your life. If you want it, pray with me these words right now. Jesus, that's right, Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me. But I know beyond that, Lord, that you are the creator of all of the universe. And you have power and strength beyond anything that my mind can comprehend. And so right now, I ask for the power of God to come into my life. Transform me, Jesus. Make me into the person that you want. And I give myself to you from this moment on. I'm yours, and I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. If you prayed with me, by the way, I want to give you something. It's called a new day. It'll help you down the road. But uh, hey, knowing the Lord is a great experience. It's an adventure, and it'll never get old. You can call in 1-800-759-0700 and just say, I prayed with Pat. I have come into the Lord, and the Lord's power is working in my life right now. Terry? Well, Grill Masters, it's time to wake from your winter slumber, and this season, add some new favorites to your arsenal. We've got a nine-time barbecue champ ready to dish it out. All that when we return. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Voters in Ireland will decide Friday if it will become the first country to add same-sex marriage to its constitution by a popular vote. People in the capital of Dublin are divided ahead of the vote. Opponents say same-sex marriage is not fair to children 
while supporters say it's about equality. We're such a, an active generation when it comes to protesting and getting our voice heard, and it, it feels amazing to be part of history. Children should have an equal right to a mother and a father where, where possible. And the clause that we're being asked to vote on in, in the ref, on the referendum is that there is no distinction between the relationship that a man forms with a man and a man forms with a woman. And I've had both types of relationship, and I think there is a distinct difference. Mm. Ireland legalized civil partnerships for same-sex couples in 2011. Students at a Welsh university have voted to ban Bibles from residence halls in the name of multiculturalism. The London Daily Mail reports that keeping Bibles in the halls is a tradition at Aber Iswith University, Prince Charles' alma mater. But now students have voted to remove the Gideon Bibles from dorm rooms, claiming they could be potentially offensive to non-Christians. James Catford, an alumnus who now leads the Bible Society, says that the answer to a diverse and multicultural society is not to remove all traces of diversity. That seems illiberal and intolerant. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, ask any seasoned pitmaster, and he's going to tell you man invented fire so man could have his very first barbecue. Well, for Christopher Prieto, the combination of fire and food is nothing short of a match made in heaven. With warm weather upon us, it's time to fire up the grill. But instead of that same old hot dogs and hamburgers routine, how about serving up some barbecued salmon, smoked pork butt, or Texas-style beef brisket? Restaurant owner and pitmaster Chris Prieto is a nine-time barbecue champion. In the Southern Living Ultimate Book of Barbecue, he shares proven grilling tips, techniques, and recipes that'll take your grilling to a whole new level. Mm, that's prime time. Oh yeah, it's prime time, baby. Well, Christopher Prieto is with us now, and welcome. Uh, Great to have you, you so here. I shake your me. glove here. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about how you got started in all this. You were young, just five I, years old. I was, I was. Uh, my father studied in Texas. He was getting his uh, PhD at Texas A&M, and we would frequent little small barbecue restaurants. And when I was five, he took me to my first barbecue place and just fell in love at first sight. You are fascinated. <laughs> yes. I find that so interesting. Mm -hmm. And and I know that you call, you say that you have a calling for all of this because it's not just that you love barbecue. Right. You've got some techniques going here on every yeah. level, the seasoning, the yep. rubs, the smoking, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Why do you call it a calling? Uh, well, uh, God called me at a young age, at five, and uh, kind of everything I've done in life has always circled back to barbecue. Um, and then I found Jesus through barbecue, and the easiest way to share it with people and the, what's been most effective is through my barbecue. So every step of my life that I've walked through, barbecue's been a part of you it. You have a comparison between yes. what God's done in your life mm -hmm. and what you're doing yes. in the barbecue arena. One of the things I loved about your book, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, but is you, for those of us who didn't grow up with this, you outline every cut of meat that's yeah. potentially usable, mm -hmm. even fish, yeah. the slaw that yeah. goes with yeah. it. I mean, you've got it all in there. What is this cut that we're looking at right uh, here? We're looking at a pork butt, uh, and ironically, it's not off the rear end of the pig. It's actually the top of the shoulder, shoulder. It's the butt mm -hmm. of the shoulder. Um, it's well marbled. It's very forgiving throughout the cook. So you can kind of overcook it and it's okay. You can undercook it and it's still very good. Uh, and you can introduce a lot to it. So it's kind of an open palate for any pit master chef or grill master. Well, I see that you've got an array of spices here and you, you make your own rubs. I do. Uh, and a this. very so important component is going to be the rub. It's going to create a bark, which is going to be that outside brown layer uh, where all that flavor is going to come okay. from. Okay. Will you start putting the rub on there as you talk to us about what you've got here, what you've put together? Absolutely. And what I've put together here is some paprika. Uh, so should I put the, yeah absolutely go in here? please okay. do paprika is going to build a beautiful color to it and put a little bit of peanut oil as my binder first okay. I always like to make sure now adding next is going to be that terminado sugar I put the okay whole thing? yes the whole thing in there okay. now this you can build and you make it in large batches so you can use it on You've anything it on in the hand. household mm -hmm. okay then we're going to add in the seasoned salt okay. and then uh, along with it some black pepper 
Okay. Well, this is smelling wonderful <laughs> yeah, already. Of course, of course. <laughs> and you want to build that beautiful color along with mm -hmm. making sure you have beautiful transition spices. It's going to be onion powder. And anytime you put onion powder with something, you want to put garlic powder with it as well. Oh, okay. That's going to be the next one. Our signature spice in this dish is going to be the fresh oregano, mm. okay? And the heat in it's going to be the chipotle powder. Now, oh. I always like to add the heat last because you can put it in, but you can't take it out, Yeah. okay? I should tell people <laughs> these were all pre-measured. I'm not just dumping bottles. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you can find all the increments and in the rub recipe itself in the book, The Ultimate Book of Barbecue. Um, and now, you're slathering this yes. on there. That's so, two things I like to do with a pork butt is you want to be very generous with the rub, okay? It, you can't over rub this meat. Okay. But I also don't like to use the word rub so much because I don't want to actually rub Are you the kind rub of into the meat. It on there? I'm just kind of setting it on there and then I'll pick it up and then I'll just push it on there. Okay. Every time I rub the meat, it's going to clog those pores that the salts are opening mm -hmm. up and trying to do, okay? And then at this point now, I'm going to open up my smoker. I'm setting this smoker here, it's a water smoker, so I always want some type of moisture in the environment of my cooker. I like to cook with a little bit of pecan and sugar maple wood. I'm setting it at 275 degrees. I'm just gonna lay this pork butt right wow. down in there. It's gonna hear a little bit of a sear. That's when you now, know you hit 275. Did you need to inject it with something or no? I, I did. Uh, oh, you so, did. Yes. Okay. So what we wanna do is, uh, after we rub it, we're gonna inject it with a brine. And okay. this we wanna do prior and let it sit for about four to six hours. Oh, okay? wow, okay. This is the injection. It's gonna have a little bit of apple juice. Mm. It's gonna have uh, some hot sauce, some of the rub itself in it. Okay. okay. And then you wanna get a large enough injector so you can inject in one inch intervals okay. all throughout that pork butt. Now you've got, we've got one over here because this is television. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's what so we do. So this is one cook, but before well, I do it, I'm going to show you how to build the perfect sandwich. Okay. okay? Yes, I would so love So we're going to start with our North Kakalaki sauce. Again, the recipe can be found in the book. Kakalaki. Yes. So it's going to have a nice base of apple cider vinegar. Very important to any North Carolina sauce. I'm going to add a little bit of sweetness to it, some fresh apple juice and then some brown sugar. Mm. Okay. I'm going to thicken it up a little bit with some fresh ketchup. And I'm gonna transition the overwhelmingness of that apple cider vinegar with a little bit of fresh lemon juice. Ah, it's gonna balance it all out. It out. Mm -hmm. okay. And then for a little bit heat, I'm gonna add a little bit of hot sauce, crushed red pepper or cayenne pepper, salt and pepper. And then how you know when the sauce is done is actually when we add the crushed red pepper in there, the crushed red pepper is gonna sink to the bottom of the sauce. That's how you know ah, when it's done. Okay. So I just kind of mix all these together and just let that red pepper flake how float on top. How long does that usually take before About the pepper? About 15 minutes, okay. depending on how high you have it, but at medium degree, 15 minutes. Okay. And this is this gonna is be the, the finished, finished product. product here. Beautiful, <laughs> kind of a silky, nice mahogany looking sauce. Then next, we're gonna make sure we build a beautiful coleslaw. That this is, is beautiful. It is. And one thing, it's it's appealing to the eye, but it's also gonna cool down all these smoky mm -hmm. and kind of spicier flavors, which we're building on. So to build the perfect pulled pork sandwich, we wanna get a nice bun, a nice taut bun mm -hmm. that's gonna take all this food. We're gonna bring it right over here, okay? Put that cool, beautiful slaw there. We're gonna open up the finished product and halfway through the cook, wow. I've wrapped the pork butt. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do is I like to pull this in chunks. I want my sandwich to be quite unctuous. Uh -huh. You know, I want it to be very chunky. Like so what I'm literally pulling yes. in chunks. So every, air is the enemy with pork. So every time I pull it with forks or anything, it's just going to get more and more dry. So I'm going to take it in these big chunks. And you know, usually I don't wear gloves and that is fine because okay. I can lick my fingers. I after. like you. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit of that dripping wow. right on the bottom of this foil. I'm going to drip that on. I'm gonna add a little bit of fresh slaw here to the top, okay? Wow. I'm gonna finish it with some of that North Kakalaki sauce. Look at that. Do That's, I actually get to taste this? If you would like, absolutely. The perfect pulled pork Thank you. sandwich. I'm gonna put this here if I can, just because your Kakalaki <laughs> sauce might be on my Kakalaki pants. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> Getting wow. more pork than slaw is always good. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Amazing. My hands are filthy and so are yours. But yes. I want you to try this for yourself. I want you to get his book, The Ultimate Book of Barbecue. 
It's called Southern Living's Ultimate Book of Barbecue. You can get this recipe full of everything you need to know about barbecue, available nationwide. Oh, let's shake hands with oh, yes. that. <laughs> Chris Priano, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for having awesome. me. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Back to you, Pat. Well, that sandwich looks delicious. How in the world you got your mouth around that? I'll never know, but you did it. Terry, you're a pro. I'm, congratulations. What an interesting segment. Thank you. That's what you do for spring. My goodness gracious. You know, it's, a, it's an art. And they've got special rubs for this, uh, something in Memphis and something in Dallas and something down in Carolina. And they've all got the way of cooking pigs. Well, coming up, your email questions. Michelle says, that, get this, my husband left me and our boys three years ago. He's waiting on me to file for divorce, but I don't believe in divorce. What should I do? Well, that's a question that we will be bringing it on after a quick break. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Welcome back. In China, a young couple was faced a heartbreaking dilemma. They had two sons, each of whom were deaf, but they had only enough money to buy one hearing aid. Yeah. The Lu's expected having a two-year-old boy would bring lots of activity and laughter into their home. Instead, there was silence. Meng Fei could not talk and we had a hard time getting his attention. When I asked him to clap his hands or just point to different places on his face, he would not do it. When they had their second son, Yi, they noticed something was wrong with his hearing. So they got their boys tested and found out both were deaf. I lost my will to live. I just sit down on the floor with the test results in my hand and wept. I cried so much that I couldn't even feed my baby. The Lu's worried about the future. How would my disabled boy survive if they could not hear or speak? I knew people would look down on them, and they probably would never marry. The brothers needed hearing aids and language training. But as a construction worker, Mr. Lu makes less than $100 a week. So all he could afford was one hearing aid for Meng Fei, and it didn't even fit. I cried as I told Yi, Mommy and Daddy are so sorry, we can't give you a hearing aid too. I hated myself for not being able to provide everything my kids needed. As a father, I wanted to do better. After a little progress, Meng Fei's hearing aid broke, and once again, there was silence at home. He kept pointing to his ears to try to tell us that he wanted to be able to hear again. I prayed, dear God, please help us and give us another hearing aid. Then a friend told her about CBN, and we got Meng Fei the new hearing aid his mother had prayed for. We surprised Yi and gave him one too. Now there's plenty of love and laughter in the Lu's home. My younger son responds to us immediately now. And my older son's hearing has improved a lot. He's learning fast. Without CBN, my children will not be able to hear or speak. I hope that the help you give others will never end. What well, sweet children. You brought life. You say you brought life to a family, to a couple of little boys. You did it. That's not a bad thing. You, you know, you stand before the Lord and you say, what'd you do? Well, I brought life to a couple of little boys in China. Wonderful. So you want to do something more? We'd like you to. I'd like you to participate uh, with us uh, uh, in helping those who are less fortunate it's a 700 Club membership is 65 cents a day, or you can make a special gift. And I want to give you something called the Transforming Word, which are the verses of health and healing from the Psalms. And uh, I think you'll like them. People have said very, very nice things about this uh, DVD, and we'll give it to you. Uh, the Healing Word, and it's there for you. We'll give you this. 
And uh, I think you will be blessed. So call in right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's help those who are hurting around the world. What do you got? Well, it's time to bring it on. All right, let's do okay, it. This first question, Pat, is from Michelle, who says, My husband left me and our boys for someone else three years ago. We both know Christ as our Lord and Savior. However, my husband is waiting for me to file for divorce. I don't want a divorce or believe in it. Since then, I've been praying for God to tell me what to do. I know God gives us freedom and that he can also restore our marriage. Why hasn't he answered me? I still love my husband, but don't know what to do. Well, um, I would give you this advice. I mean, you, you've got to wait as long as you want to. But uh, the truth is, uh, from just a legal standpoint, you need support for your children. You need uh, a living arrangement that makes some sense. And uh, you have to get a judicial decree that establishes that. Uh, if you want a, a, a separation agreement as opposed to a divorce, they can get all kinds of things. A creative lawyer could help you. But you need to do something. You just can't sit around and be abused because uh, it's going to hurt your children. And you need to look after the kids. Yeah. All right. Okay, this is Susanna who says, Can you please let me know if the Book of Mormon is from Jesus Christ? Two ladies said they were Christian and gave me the Book of Mormon. The ladies explained to me about John Smith and told me the history of the book. But to me, it feels wrong. What's your opinion about the book? Thank mm -hmm. you. It's Joseph, Joseph Smith. Smith. Yeah, not yeah. John mm -hmm. Joseph. Um, he claimed that the angel Moroni came and gave him these... Uh, uh, golden tablets, and this is where he got the Book of Mormon. Uh, I, I hate to say it, I, I really, there's some wonderful Mormon people, but I can't buy their religious beliefs. Well, no one else ever saw them, right? Oh, no one else ever no, saw no, those it's, it's, tablets. it's the same thing as Muhammad. He got a revelation from some jinn uh, in a cave, and that's the, the, the basis of all the stuff he, he believes in. Uh, it's not Jesus Christ. They call themselves the Latter-day Saints of you know, Jesus Christ, but uh, it's not, and I'm sorry. Uh, the Christian church has never acknowledged that uh, Mormonism is an orthodox religion. It just isn't, but there's some very wonderful people who adhere to this uh, religion. But it's, it, it, that's where it came from. He claimed an angel Moroni gave it to him. All right. With additional scriptures, right? That was. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. It's, it's added to the Bible. Sure. Okay. This is Susan who says, I have prayed and prayed for a healing from my handicaps, but none has come my way. My doctor labeled me with MS, but I believe he's wrong. I believe that God is using my ailments to his good. I've had preachers tell me I'm wrong, that if I truly believed, God would heal me. Who's correct? Well, I don't know you, and I don't know all these people who have been talking to you, so I, I can't analyze exactly what's there. But I have prayed for people with MS, and I have seen people get up out of wheelchairs with MS and, and were healed. There's something about that disease that almost takes on a life of its own, and you have to resist it, and you have to fight it, and you have to speak about it in the name of Jesus. And it, it, is a, it is a debilitating, horrible thing when you've got it. But at the same time, Jesus will, will give you healing from it. So uh, I, I can't say beyond that because I don't know you. I don't know your problem. But uh, please believe me that the Lord has an answer uh, for the problem that you have. Well, uh, we thank you for being with us. We leave you with our Power Minute from Proverbs 16. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Well, tomorrow, our dear friend Jay Sekulow reveals how the Washington uh, fat cats are robbing you of your freedom. You don't want to miss it. He's got an interesting book, and uh, he'll be with us, Jay Sekulow, the American Center for Law and Justice. That's all the time we've got. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.